Afternoon guys, Dr. Ken Arbery down. Same day. See, it's, uh, we've got temperatures in the 40s here today. Before I know it, we'll be basking in the 50s. <laughs> it's, I mean, they're saying we'll be in the 50s next weekend. That's kind of nice. Snow is starting to melt. We're starting to see beer driveway again. <laughs> Not just sheets of ice. Um, kind of nice. Well, Today uh, we're going to continue along this road about nitty gritty things you should know if you're going to be a serious buck hunter. And uh, today we're going to talk about how bucks react to the approach of a human under different circumstances. You know, and uh, compare them with other deer, but older bucks especially. Because you hardly ever see those bucks in the woods hunting the old traditional ways, you know, the way people, most people stand on nowadays or guys that sneak and stop often going through the woods or guys just wander aimlessly through a square mile, you know, or guys making drives. But those are the, the ways we hunt nowadays. Making drives still real popular in the country. And sure, a lot of deer are taken by people making drives, but mostly young deer mostly fawns and yearlings uh, because they'll continue going downwind without realizing why. Older deer realize that's not good to do, you know. And so not many older bucks were taken that way. And I was part of a gang that did that for 15 years and we only got one decent buck in all those years. All the rest were small bucks and does and fawns. So, uh, but we all thought, we thought that was great in those days. Gee, 11 guys get 11 deer in two days, making drives, things like that. But that, I was never happy with that. I wanted to hunt bucks. <laughs> you know, I wanted to hunt a buck like they had cover of Field and Street Magazine or Sports Field or, or uh, any of them. And it uh, seemed like everybody wanted to do that, but not many people succeeded. And uh, so that's what got me started on the road to studying habits and behavior of whitetails. Beginning back in the early 1960s, scientifically after 1970. Well, anyway, it's kind of interesting this thing about how bucks respond to an approaching hunter. You know, it would be very easy now that you know, you know, the last two seminars we've done here today. It'd be easy to realize that most time when you're out in the woods and you're walking somewhere to a stand site, for example, uh, it'd be easy to realize that bucks out there in that in that area know you're coming. They heard your dar your car heard door slam, your pickup door slam, and two of you, you heard them talking, you know, get in the back there and get your gun out, yeah. And Jacking bullets into your gun at bolt action or whatever, and, and uh, uh, turning off the engine, you know, and finally lights locking up. Now, you know, now you know more about what you know, older bucks, the, the four and a half to six year old, the bucks in their prime. It would be hard to believe bucks up to quite up to a mile away, you know, a car door. You can you if you don't believe it, sometime have somebody slam a car door for you at the end of the trail that you use to go to where you're gonna hunt. A mile away you hear it. Bang, there it goes. And it no doubt it's nothing but a car door slamming. Voices you might not hear, but there's other things. But nowadays, you know, back in the old days, people used to think the white tails they saw along the road when they're driving somewhere in a vehicle. There's white tails feeding in the ditch over here and on the hillside over here. You can get close to them with a motor vehicle, you know. Well, nowadays, at least where I am, uh, there is still poaching going on at night. And you drive down a road, uh, last blacktop road, uh, getting to where I turn off in the gravel road. You drive along that road in the evening, if there's any deer along the edge of the road feeding in the ditches, 
where the nice grass. Uh, if you slow down or stop, they go. Man, the tails are up and they're running every which way. And that should tell you right away that whitetails know what it means when they hear a vehicle coming toward them. They hear the engine going and then it stops. You know, like at the base of a trail or an old logging road going off in the woods. They know, these older deer do, pretty soon there's going to be some hunters coming up that trail. So time to be really alert. Um, you hear anything that, anything that suggests here they come, you hear their boots crunching in snow or on gravel or what, swishing through grasses, the heels dragging as they walk like some of them are inclined to do, uh, stepping on dead branches that snap loudly on their foot. And, well, humans do more of that than any other creature in the woods. All these things tell me very easily, here comes a human, just sounds alone. So what do the big bucks do? Well, if they, if they, you know, if they determine here comes somebody, it's usually when they're still far enough, it's far enough away, so you can't see them. They can hear you coming. They've got that figured out, and you, they were alerted to begin with by the sound of your vehicle, whether an ATV or an OHV or a snowmobile or a truck or a car. They were alerted, and it stopped. And that's that stopping one. That's the dangerous one. It's like when you stop along a highway where poachers have been working, boy, they're gone right away. So anyway, uh, they're alerted by that. Now then they hear, oh yeah, just as expected, here comes a hunter, two hunters, three. But here they come. Well, the older bucks aren't going to be concerned about that at first. I mean, you know, the only time they get really excited about this is if all of a sudden there's a hunter right there and they didn't hear him coming, they didn't expect him. Or, they were over there on the side, and they had moved aside, right, and they're standing in cover, and they're just going to watch you go by. And you won't even notice them where they are, and when they're sitting still in their natural camouflage, or they're standing very still, or they're laying down, they're very still, grass around them and other things. Well, you aren't going to see them, you aren't going to notice them. And but besides that, you, you're going up there somewhere where the sta your stand is, so you're walking along like that. Well, then let's say for some reason, uh, let's say you, you, you see these big tracks going across the trail right here. And you're thinking, boy, right away, boy, those are big ones. And you stop to look at them. That stopping will right away, war most deer, if you did that with a fawn or a yearling or a doe, Snort, snort, and bound away with all possible speed. Away they go. You do it with a big buck, and he's going to size you up before he goes. But at this point, he's ready to go. He's, he's poised to leave the area. Now, big bucks hate to make a lot of noise when they go. They don't want you to know them. To, they don't want you to know they're there to begin with. You know. When a lot of deer, when you get close to them, and then they decide to start bounding away, they make noise and brush snapping and maybe snorting, and that's some, a lot of hunters. The only way they know when they're near a deer is when a deer is bounding and going, and oh, there's the tail, and, and get an automatic and take six shots and empty the gun when they see at that white tail and hardly ever actually hit the deer. But there's a lot of hunters that can't see a deer unless it's, or hear it, until they hear one bounding away. Well, I don't know if that's the reason big bucks hate to bound away, but they hate to draw attention to themselves when they leave. When a big buck leaves, under those kind of circumstances, he might what, what, stay right where he was, frozen in color, watching him, and see what you do. Now, if you, if after stopping, you start going ahead, straight ahead, he might just stay there until you're out of sight or out of hearing. And then he'll leave. But now he's kind of worried about you, you know. Whitetails hate hunters that unexpectedly stop somewhere, you know. Like you might stop and then actually turn and look over toward where the deer is, maybe look this way and look that way. When you do that, 
that white cow is starting to think maybe you know it's there. It, it, it smelled you or something or heard you and it's looking over there. Now they're saying, the jig is up. i got to do something. Or if you turn and say, I'm going to follow these tracks and it's leading right to where the deer is. In that case, that deer is going to get, it's going to lead it really fast. Now whitetails like to, big bucks especially, like to utilize heavy cover. They, they don't want to be out in the clear where they can really bound really. They don't get back in the cover and they'll bind up be bounding over brush and all kinds of, you know, fallen trees and that kind of thing as they're going, which discourages pursuit. But uh, they'll stick to heavy cover and you, you probably might get a glimpse or two. And they might snort once. If you, if you, if you uh, alarm them unexpectedly, you're really close and you were to stop and look their way or, or move their direction, that probably is really upsetting to a big buck, and some of them will snort repeatedly as they go. They didn't expect you to be there. But normally they know you're coming. Now, if you're coming along and you walk past that buck without stopping, after you're out of sight and hearing, he'll resume whatever he was doing. He won't. He didn't run away, he didn't make noise, he didn't draw attention to him. Let's say he was feeding on browse over here. Well, oh, he'll just go back to feeding on browse. Or let's say he was a doe and estrus there, both over there, and they froze when you went by and he kept going. No problem. What's even better, and I talked to you about the wolf roost in past seminars, it was the best way to keep deer from becoming alarmed, whether you're scouting for tracks midday or scouting. Um, uh, or going to and from a stand site is use that wolf roast and pretend you're not hunting. Look harmless as you can be. And the way to really make whitetails think you're harmless is like a car on the road that just keeps going, doesn't stop. Go non-stop, back to camp, non-stop to your trust can site and keep your head pointed straight ahead. Just go along at a moderate pace, not changing and not stopping for any reason, just keep going, you're looking straight ahead. If you're going out there in the early morning like we do a lot, you're not going to change anything in the dark anyway, so get it over with quickly. But just keep going right by them. You are going to change that buck's habits. He's not going to abandon the area. When a big buck is alarmed enough to raise his tail and bound away, he's not just bounding away. He's abandoning his range. A big buck that starts, or he doesn't start, if he's bound, he's really, really moving fast. He's moving away. He's getting off range. He's getting way out in a swamp somewhere, or a, a big spruce bog, or, or a cedar swamp. places like that, and or maybe he's got an idea of some posted land about two miles away and he's going to go there because he knows he's going to be safe there. He never sees any hunters there. Or maybe he's just going to go way deep in the woods and some place that he might have in mind might be six miles away. You know, part of a refuge area. Uh, it won't matter. I'm going to go there and he's going to stay there for two weeks. I have had an, I don't want any more of this. He'll give up breeding to stay alive under circumstances like that, at least for a couple of weeks. Long time, season to be over by the time you, you, he comes back. No more shooting going on in the woods. That's easy to figure out. So, but big bucks, there's other things they do, you know. You're, you're walking along a trail. If if it appears, you know, you're just moving along, and you're not hunting, you're not stopping and to look around, scan and sneaking, and you're not moving in that manner, just going straight. That buck is not going to be inclined to run away, make noise, snort, or anything like that. As long as you keep moving, as long as you just keep moving. Uh, if you're going along this trail, you know, a trail is kind of nice for this because it makes you predictable, like you're not just going to wander over this way and that way, you're going to stay on the trail. So that makes you predictable. And as long as you are not hunting or acting like you're hunting, well, he's not going to worry about you at all. 
allows you to safe distance away. Even closer, if he's bedded, you know, if he's bedded close to this trail you're walking on, he can be 10 yards away and he might put his head down low. You know, the, if you were to look over there, you'd see some sticks sticking up maybe in the grass over there or the, amongst the air drains. There aren't really sticks, they're antlers, but the, some will put their head down close to the ground and just lay there. No movement whatsoever. You might glance that way. You might really even notice those are antlers. You know, when you're looking for antlers in the wood, you can probably practically step on them to finally see them. You can look and look and look and look, and then take a few steps and you step, and you just step the one. I've done that. I've done that quite a few times. So, anyway, they'll do that. They won't move from that spot unless you stop. If you stop and look that way, even if you don't see them, I've had it happen to me quite a few times where I, I can remember the biggest buck I ever got. <laughs> I was heading back to camp in the evening, it was getting dark, and I was on top of a big hill, and there was a little cedar swamp down at the bottom there, and then elder swamp to the left of that. I was going this way. And I walk along, and I look down there, and I said, geez, that looks like a buck down there. And I stopped, and I looked at it, and uh, uh, the buck turned and looked at me, <laughs> and the next thing, you know, I was going to get my gun up to look at him with my scope, and I started right in. Boy, it went, way it went into that big elder swamp, a huge one, full of water. So I got him the next day after a lot of trouble. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the minute you start acting like you know where the deer is or you've selected it as a prey, you know, wolf can go, wolves do this all the time, they can march by deer and select deer on the move, on the fly, by an airborne or trail sense. They can say, oh, this, is a, this deer is sick, or this deer is losing blood, or this deer is crippled, or something that slows it down. We can get this one, but we'll not try it until we move uh, out of sight and hearing, then it'll sneak back and get him. But, but if we don't turn our head and act like we're hunting, he's going to stay here. So we got our little hunt all set up. Our wolves do this a lot. That's a, hap a good way for them to hunt. Better than just beginning pursuit right from the outset. Uh, uh, pursuit right from the outset only works about one in five times, if that. Especially when they're trying to take a, a catch at an adult deer. So that's healthy. <laughs> so they, they've got better, more sure ways to take an adult deer. But anyway, uh, so they, they move right on past, and if you do that too, you can walk within 10 yards of a deer, of a buck, that's bedded, and it won't move. It just go right on by. You might find his tracks right there, and you say, boy, after lunch, I'm coming back to this area. I gotta, and then you go back and figure out how you're going to get there from downwind without the buck over in that area and knowing it. Maybe there's a feeding area right there. Oh, boy, this is really red. This place where I want to be this evening. Well, anyway... Uh, as long as that, as long as that buck, is, you've got that buck convinced. You don't know he's anywhere in the county. He won't move. He'll stay right there. The older bucks are so bold at that, it's unbelievable. You know, younger deer, they'll lose their nerve real quickly. You start off toward one of those, you aren't going to get 10 yards from them before they finally go. Uh, and uh, a lot of those are that way too. They're really... Maybe because they got fond to feel they got to react more quickly, get away from this hill and that nose are there. So, but those big bucks, especially when they're alone, you know, not with a doe and hit, they'll do that you time after time, all day long. And you can go back camp shaking your head, there's just no big bucks in this country anymore. You gotta do something about that. <laughs> but they do that consistently. They'll let you go. I, I, every time I say these words, I remember some bucks, and I've talked about them before. Like one time I was bow hunting while I was in the Navy uh, near Portsmouth, Virginia, a Naval Weapons Station, fenced there many thousand acres, and um, and uh, I was there with a bunch of other bow hunters, and uh, 
And uh, we all sat in trees, the primitive stand used to board up there between branches, and they called them tree stands then back then, but uh, that was back in the mid-60s. And I had already been using stuff like that in my first study area, but you know, which making little places sit in trees, but that's another story. But anyway, I remember one day, I, uh, it was shortly before lunch, and there was this field next to me, grass. And the white tails have been feeding there, but there was nothing there all morning. And then about, oh, about 11.30, I see this big buck. It was really a nice one, big 10 pointer, walking along the edge of the field toward me. And a little bit further than that, there was a clump of brush and trees, thick. And it walked into there and didn't come out. And uh, pretty soon a bunch of these other guys, they all ended up in front of where I was sitting. And I got down there and I told him, I said, hey, you guys, there's one heck of a big buck in that little bunch of brush there in that field right over there. And one of my buddies, uh, Pete, so I didn't walk by there. I didn't see any deer. <laughs> I said, there is one in there, Pete. Honestly, he's there. He hasn't come out of there. He hasn't moved. And um, I said, if you don't believe me, go over there. But walk around the edge of it and look in there, maybe you'll see. And if you don't, then walk in there. And they probably might have to kick them out of there. So I said, that'd be a waste of time. There can't be any buck in there. Then <laughs> finally I thought, well, just do it. So, okay, he went in there with his bull and he walked up to it, went around it, and looked at the eye and said, go in there. So he went in there. Out came that buck. He went pounding past all these hunters. Arrows flying every which way, clicking in tree branches. Nobody came close to hitting him. But that was a good lesson. Uh, I've had that happen. Uh, oh, my! I was out. I made a little one-man drive. I saw a big buck get underneath a fallen evergreen many years ago. Uh, some of the guys made a drive through this area, and I saw that buck coming, and then it went under that tree and didn't come out of there. And, my, and I got back to the trail where my uncle and I came in there and I told him about it. I said, there's a heck of a buck laying in there. And I said, why don't you stay here and I'll go around and I'll see if I can chase him toward you. So I did that. I got out there and here's this big spruce tree. It's all green yet, you know, real thick, great big one. And it was laying there and the roots were sticking up on this one side. And I walked up and I looked down in there. Looked there, I didn't see any deer there. So well, maybe I got out of there while I was making a circle to get there. But I went along the thing a little bit, and I was on one side, and I'm, and uh, about ten feet from where the roots took in the halls, and out came the buck, and I was down in the branches looking, and it, it came up, ran right to my uncle, and he got him, <laughs> big one. And but it's another one of those. Not unusual. It's typical. Like I was t telling you about my buddy uh, Silver having a buck laying 75 yards from every day for three days, watching him <laughs> where he was, was. He didn't realize he was there, and that buck felt safe because nobody had gone up that that trail. And but he was so close to the edge that. Even if I had walked steady, which as I was doing, and the snow was about that deep, um, he would have still jumped out of there because I would have, I would have been within maybe five feet of him if he stayed there. But bucks, big bucks, do that all the time. Now, the distance a hunter is from a deer. Here's here approaching, you know. Uh, approaching an area where, where you're walking up, you know, in that direction, and there's some deer over there that you don't know about them yet. And uh, now, normally, those deer, deer that are 200 yards away, and let's say the wind's blowing toward them, they smell that. They, white tails can gauge how far you are away by your airborne sense alone. And they can gauge a lot of things from those airborne sense. If they're getting stronger, they know you're coming toward them. If they're getting weaker, they know you're going away. Uh, they might have to move a little bit, walk over here a little bit and sniff, and walk over there a little bit. 
to see if they're going right or left. But you know, if you're going this way, then you, you're, the, you're, the intensity of your odors going toward the deer are going to be going to become weaker. Well, they want to know about things like that. And whitetails, long before they even see you coming, like your stand up right up this way somewhere, they want to check this out. And they're listening, they're wanting, they, they know a human's coming, but is he, what's he going to do? You know, they want to know. Well, if you're 200 yards or more away, they won't do anything. And if it turns out you're not moving in their direction or moving away, they're going left or right, they don't care. Goodbye. And uh, if they were feeding, they'll just start feeding again. Although, once in a while, if they hear a little snap or a brush over this way or over that way, they might stop and look and listen. Uh, that, is that human coming around? making me circling around me or something, they'll, they'll remain curious for quite a while, a half hour at least. And if they don't hear anything or see anything for a half hour, they'll forget you altogether. Uh, you're obviously not uh, a problem. Now, 200 yards is fine. But less than 200 yards, they react differently. And this is one reason for years now, my sons and I, and I have always made it a point to never walk down within 200 yards. If you're going downwind towards that, never get closer than 200 yards before you do something like going this way and making a big circle until you're downwind and then coming back to the stand. Or if there's a open feeding area, you go around that too to get to a stand site on the other side. You never cross the feeding area to get to stand site. When you start getting closer than 200 yards, you're starting to make deer react differently as you get closer. Now, a lot of deer, like a doe with fawns, might decide when you're 100 yards away now, your scent is getting stronger, you're coming, might decide, time to go now, you gotta get, get your fawns together, <laughs> your yearlings or whatever, and let's go over that way and get back in that timber, and we'll get over there. And we'll kind of watch from there where we're really well covered and see what happens. And so that's what they'll do. And big bucks will, will do that as well. But a lot of times what a big buck does is watch other deer. He lets other deer figure it out for him. Now let's say there's a buck or it isn't, say breeding isn't going on, or even if it was, but let's say but, you know, these deer are going over there now. Big bucks are inclined to depend on their own notion about how to do things, how to escape a human. Uh, even when they're with a doe and estrus, they don't always follow that doe when they figure, here comes something potentially dangerous, here comes a human in their direction. They'll go one way and the doe will go this way with the fawns or whatever. But usually they'll stop somewhere there at this point. You know, you're within a hundred yards now, you know, and watch and size things up and see what happens. Well, if that scent, if they're, you know, your scent is spreading over a triangle area now, when they can be way over here now, and you're coming this way, and they can smell you way over there where they're standing in cover, they're still able to smell you because your wind, your scent spreading this way, airborne breezes turning it that way. And the buck might be over there, and same thing. And you continue coming in that direction. And when you get down to 50 yards, does and fawns won't waste time. Uh, does with fawns, they're going to leave the area. Uh, and probably never come back to that feeding area again for, oh, maybe four or five days. They might be back there on the fifth day. And maybe not. Maybe they feel safer at another one from that time on. That's what they're going to do. Well, a buck is going to be like that too, but he might even wait longer till you're actually there and you get to a stand site. And he's watching you the whole time, listening to you. Well, that's it for that stand site. You know, the buck waited long enough to definitely figure out what you're doing. And now you're a stand hunter. Oh, well, you don't mind stand hunters because they don't chase you around. They don't track you or trail you in the woods. They just sit there all day. So now I can be way over here and way over there, any direction I want to be here the rest of the day without worrying. 
I think I'll just circle around and get to where they're doing fine. Where and they left there, but I'll trail them to wherever they go. But a lot of times when it, when when it's feeding time, whether with a doe or not, mostly when they with not, a buck will trail other deer like does with young toward the feeding area, and he might stay back a hundred yards or just within sight of them, not try to catch up and be with them right away. And when they come to the edge of the fearing area from down one, they're sniffing and checking and walk over this way, and smelling, listening, they got the ears apart. They're checking to make sure it's safe to go out there before they go out there. And this buck is hanging back there within sight and watching them. And nothing seems to happen. And a lot of times the doe, uh, maybe because she's not sure or something, she'll kick fawn or, or, uh, or, uh, 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 yearling to encourage them to go on out there. And so they go out there because they don't know any better. And nothing happens. Well, I guess it's all right. And then the doe will go out there. And then the buck, he's watching all this. Well, he still won't rush to be out there. No, he's going to watch them for a while because no ambushes can be laying along the edges there. And he want to make sure there's none out there. And he's going to watch them for a while. And if any of them all of a sudden turn and they've got their heads up and their ears forward and they're really looking at something over this way, that's it for the buck. He's not going out there. Or uh, if the tail rose up on the deer, uh, they might stand there if they're not sure, but they're afraid. This, this seems bad. And the tail goes up maybe halfway or all the way up, rump hairs uh, and tail, white tail. Uh, hair standing out, tail getting real wide looking if he's doing that. And when a white tail raises his tail, those glands on the inside of his behind legs, the tarsal glands, start pouring out this ammonia like odor that I call danger scent. And any deer that's downwind of that coming out of there will know there's something dangerous over that way. So this buck is watching those deer and he might smell that scent, you know, danger scent in the air. He's using those deer like radar, and bucks do it a lot. They do it before breeding begins, and then afterwards, especially afterwards, and for about two weeks after that first phase of the uh, of breeding, and the first of the three is over, uh, about mid-November, a little bit beyond that, like the 17th where we are. That buck is a pretty tired buck, and he'll not do a lot of moving, and when he does, he'll follow the nearest doe with young to feeding her. Stay well back in her track, um, sniffing for danger scent along as he goes, listening, any, hear any snorting or any bounding, you know, that's pretty easy to figure out. Uh, but he's using those deer to make sure it's safe when he's going to this feeding area. And then he's watching them out there, and, and then when he's finally satisfied, there's nothing to worry about here, or then he'll finally show up out there. Now, when breeding's going on, he'll probably be close to her. He doesn't want to leave her, be far away from that doe when she's in him, for fear that some other buck might get to her before he does. So he's going to stay close to her then. But anyway, uh, so 50 yards, when, thing, when a deer, when a hunter's within 50 yards, uh, when a buck goes, and when he decides to go, you know, you're coming out there, uh, whether, no matter what you're doing, if you're snaking or a walking steady, when he decides to go, more than likely he will leave as quietly as possible. I started to talk about that a little bit earlier. But what big bucks do so often under those circumstances is walk away, either slowly and very silently, very quietly away, uh, generally utilize, utilizing heavy cover and going to walk across the big opening at that point, uh, you know, like a feeding or they're going to stick to heavy cover and their tail will stay down. They will not raise their tail. They don't want you to see a white tail, the white tail up there. They don't want you to see where they're going. They don't want you to hear where they're going. Uh, if they're in a hurry to do this, they'll more than likely trot. They won't bound. They're more likely to trot. They can move pretty fast when they're trotting. You know, their 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 trucks when they're trotting are about up to eight, uh, eight ten feet apart, 
and it seems like there's just a dot here and a dot here, where all the, the all the tracks are ending in those one those little spots like that, that far apart. But they're really moving pretty fast, but they're under control and they're not just leaping through brush to make noise. Their antlers aren't clattering on tree branches, none of that. They're moving swiftly but silently. They're in control when they're doing that. So those are things bucks will do. The tail up response, for example. There's lots of reasons why deer raise their tails up. One of the, well, the, one of the main functions of that white tail, white rump, which you can see a long ways away, uh, is most useful to a doe with young. Now, uh, a grown-up doe can leap further and faster than her young, the yearlings and fawns. And when, when they start running, you know, they're hoping the fawn and, and yearling behind them is keeping up. But they're not going to just keep turning around to find out until they're in good cover and they can watch to see if they're being pursued. But she'll take off. Now the white tail is a beacon, you know, like a light out there in the woods and the youngsters can follow where that doe is going easily can see it. But she might run out of sight real fast. But that's no problem either because those tarsal glands pouring out of the scent is, is making a path that ammonia-like odor along a path, they can run, I've seen young deer run full tilt uh, behind a door that's out of sight with their nose close to the ground because they're following that path that's easily smelled. Uh, it takes them right to, the, right to their mothers and mother might be waiting in that thick cover they're in, they'll run right to her. So I was like my dog, my, my favorite uh, duck dog, Rip. I used to leave him in the in the car, with the window open, uh, to do some jump shooting for black ducks many years ago on a little stream, river, kind of going through the woods, and and I tell him to stay on each day, and then I'd leave him there, and then I'd go off into the woods, and I'd just go sneak along <laughs> the river, and and jump black ducks here and there, usually in pairs, and pow, pow, and, and when he heard me shoot, geez, he'd come out of that car like a bullet and with his nose close to the ground and follow my trail and all the way to where it was, go right by me and jump in the water expecting he's going to see a dead duck laying out there somewhere and sometimes I had to give him hand signals to, you know, and um, anyway, those young deer following their mothers under those circumstances, they like that. Now, take a big buck, he doesn't have to worry about young, he has nothing to do with raising young. Old yearling bucks start learning what is how to be like a buck when they get to spend time with an older buck, you know. And uh, so sometimes they'll get lots of that kind of training if they're lucky, but most of the time they don't. But this big buck, he didn't have to worry about those younger deer, he didn't care. He, he's going to go his own way and there will be no big flag, white flags, telling him where to go. And not only that, because he's under control, there would be no trail of tarsal scent leading to where he's going as well, you see, unless he's bounding. If his tail isn't bounding, then he's leaving that too. You know, white tails, that, when they get to a safe distance away, plus a little, uh, when, they, when they're bounding like that, as soon as they can, they want to stop. For two reasons. One is, they want to check their back trail, listen and smell and hear, and, uh, and uh, to see if they're being trailed, you know, the wolf or man or bear or whatever, is there something coming? And also, they want to lick their tarsal glands. And when they lick their tarsal glands, they clean off all the scent that's been coming out of it, you know, that's getting to the air, and get them cleaned off, so that from that point on, they're not releasing that anymore. They're not leaving a, a strong, scent smell that wolves could follow, you know. They don't know us humans can't smell. <laughs> so they would do that for humans as well as wolves. But uh, they want to clean that off because they don't want that trail easy to follow from that point on. But uh, anyway, that that's something to know too. But bucks would, you know, especially if you're a tree stand hunter, if one finds you in a tree, Unless, <clears throat> it, you 
you know, didn't know you there, and all of a sudden it was right there, <laughs> right in front of you. That was why you didn't want to shoot. You know, I, this is only a two and a half year old, I'm not going to shoot that bottom corner. This is three and a half, these, those antlers I'm kind of impressed. I, it doesn't have to be, but I, we, we're hunting older bucks here. And uh, so uh, might let some of those go by, and then all of a sudden he sees you up there, and you were careless, and you moved. Holy cow, there's a human there. Snort, snort, away he'll go, you know. But uh, but most time, if you're just sitting up there quietly and not making a lot of movements, and, and uh, that bigger buck, he sees you up there, even if he doesn't smell you, if he's coming from a different direction, and you're right there, he'll move away so quietly you won't believe it. He'll back off. And Sneak away with his tail down. That's big buck stuff. And that's part of the reason we, another reason we don't see so many of them in the woods because they do that. They don't want to attract your attention. They'll be as quiet as they can be when moving away, and they won't raise those tails, that white flag, when they're moving away. Okay, guys, uh, before you leave, be sure to press that red button down there and subscribe for my YouTube channel. I appreciate that. You guys have been a wonderful attend. Millions, <laughs> well, million and 14,000 so far. Now do that and, and get the thumbs up button too as well. That's important uh, to YouTube and uh, to me. So then another thing uh, with the coronavirus coming to your to wherever you live, it's going to be true for all of us in the next weeks. Get ready to, you know, have something to pass the time when you're told don't go to work, <laughs> stay home, that kind of thing. You might be there a couple of weeks, so you get a good book, like <laughs> my Whitetail Hunter Almanac, where you learn everything and have it on record in your book that I talk about, and a bear book as well for, for bear hunting. Two good books to have around at that time. Might even get a, a crossword puzzle to work on or two, you know, that's kind of fun. And instead of just watching TV all the time. And uh, so do that. It'd be a good time, a good place to finally learn everything you need to learn to be a regularly successful hunter of older bucks. Those four and a half to six year old year olds. And finally start seeing them. The bucks hardly, that most hunters hardly ever see. So, but they're there. So, with that, thanks again for watching. And, uh, oh, we're, we'll get into another part now. There's some more nitty gritty about bucks, things you should know about them. You know, what, and this makes a difference in how you hunt them, you know. And uh, uh, everything I told you about how they react when you're going toward them in the woods, that's what they do. That's got, to, that's got to be on your mind when you're hunting big bucks all the time, going to and from stand sites or when scouting mid during the hunting season. Those things have got to be on your mind. And where you think, you wonder if something you really have to do? Yes, you, even though you don't see what happens, good or bad, because of the, what you're doing, it's happening. Most time because you don't know it, and so you don't think this is the way it is. And don't make a mistake, a lot of other guys do. Those big bucks are nothing like fawns and yearlings and does. These are different animals. Much better at dealing with you than any other one tells. So, remember that. Okay, thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you again soon. Be sure to visit my website. Here's the link. Here you'll find links to my blog posts, my Twitter account, my YouTube account, my Amazon store with links to my ebooks, my son's eBay store, a money saver if you're ordering from Canada or other countries, my website bookstore, and much more.